Thank you so much. The January 11th, 2022 meeting of the Public Safety and Human Services Committee will now come to order. It is 9.30 a.m. I'm Lisa Herbold, Chair of the Committee. Will the Clerk please call the roll? Member Lewis. Present. Councilmember Mosqueda. Councilmember Nelson. Present. Councilmember Peterson. Present. Chair Herbold. Present. Or present, one absent. Great, thank you so much. So this is our first meeting of the year and I'd like to start off with a warm welcome to our new members. Uh, Council Member Nelson, Council Member Mosqueda, who I believe will be joining us in a bit. Um, and Council Member Peterson, who was an alternate um, over the last two years and is now a regular member. I wanna thank you all for your willingness to serve on this committee. On today's agenda, we'll be hearing first a briefing from the Director of the Office of Police Accountability on his findings about the Proud Boys ruse used by the Seattle Police Department on June 8, 2020. We'll also be hearing an update from Public Health on COVID-19. And then finally, we'll be receiving a briefing on the December 9th emergency 9-11 system outage from of our community safety and communications center um, and um, moving right into the approval of the agenda we'll we'll approve our agenda if there are um, no objections today's agenda will be adopted hearing no objection today's agenda is adopted uh, as I noted in council briefings yesterday there are some schedule limitations on the availability of presenters um, and so we'll need to do our best uh, to stick to the schedule as much as possible and I um, I have a tendency to um, let things run uh, run long and I'm just putting folks um, on notice that I um, will be doing everything I can to not let that happen um, in this in this meeting so we can get to everything on today Today's agenda. This time we'll be transitioning into public comment. As always, I will moderate the public comment period um, as follows. Each speaker will be given two minutes to speak. I will call on each speaker by name and in the order which they registered on the council's website. If you've not yet registered to speak but would like to do so, you can sign up before the end of the public hearing by going to the council's website link is also listed on today's agenda. Once I call a speaker's name, the speaker will hear a prompt. And once you've heard that prompt, you need to press star six to unmute yourself. And we ask that you please begin stating your name and the item which you are addressing. Speakers will hear a chime when 10 seconds are left of the allotted time. And once the speaker hears the chime, we ask that you begin to wrap up your public comments. Speakers do not end their comments at the end of the allotted time provided. The speaker's mic will be muted after 10 seconds to allow us to hear from the next speaker. Once you've completed your public comment, we ask that you please disconnect from the line. Um, I encourage you, if you, if you like, to continue to uh, follow the meeting. You can do so via the Seattle channel or the listening options that are listed on the agenda. We've got 11 people signed up for public comment today and just want to recognize that Council Member Mosqueda has joined the meeting. Good morning, Council Member Mosqueda. So um, I'll just jump in and begin calling folks. I'm gonna call people um, names two at a time. So the next speaker will know that they're coming up next. Uh, our first speaker this morning is Howard Gale, followed by Laura Love, Howard. Good morning, Howard Gale, District 7. You've been faced with overwhelmingly clear and consistent facts and data. Continuing racial disparity in the SPD use of force. Continuing racial disparity in SPD stops. The 2020 constitutional and unconstitutional egregiously violent actions against demonstrators with virtually all abusive officers exonerated. And the SPD having killed more people in the years after John T. Williams than before. You have watched as our police accountability system has determined recent killings, like the SPD murder of Terry Caver days before George Floyd, to be, quote, lawful and proper, followed by the all-too-predictable SPD murder of Derek Hayden last year, and then, just six days ago, another person in mental health crisis wielding knives was gunned down by the SPD. 
a fact that remained unnoticed in council briefing yesterday. This was the 19th person suffering a mental health crisis killed by the SPD since John T. Williams, all lawful and proper. These abuses of justice don't just happen. It requires the folks in power at the OPA, the OIG, and the CPC to actively undermine accountability. Two high-level investigators at the OIG risk their livelihoods and well-being to sound the alarm and to explain to us how all these failings of accountability are possible. Carolyn Dick at the South Seattle Emerald documented all this in 11 investigative pieces. KOW reported on the abuses engaged in by Andrew Meyerberg, whose entire career has been spent defending police, including defend New York City against the rightful claims of the Central Park Five, and when working as a city attorney in Seattle, was sanctioned by the court for hiding evidence during his prosecution of a man who was abused by police. Despite all this, your solution today is to hear from the folks who have actually worked to minimize and cover up police abuse instead of hearing from the people who have lived and uncovered the facts of SPD disinformation campaign. We need civilian control of police accountability. Go to seattlestop.org to find out how, seattlestop.org. Thank you, Howard. Our next speaker is Laura Lowe, and Laura will be followed by Peter Condit. Laura? Good morning, Council, and thanks for your service to Seattle. My name is Laura. I'm speaking on the agenda topic of the police ruse. I'm speaking also on behalf of Share the City's Action Fund, as well as myself as a renter in Seattle. Share the City's Action Fund is a grassroots housing advocacy organization who are in coalition with communities most impacted by our broken justice systems. We have some core questions about the police ruse. But first, we'd like to say the treatments of members of the community as enemies to be tricked into committing offenses put everyone at risk, including neighborhood residents who might have been literally caught in crossfire. And the sad truth is that Spog and SPD lied to the people of Seattle and also the former mayor, who maybe claims to have not been in control of the police during this time. Where is your urgency to address this? Are you able to immediately change Spog leadership, a step towards establishing trust that demonstrates you are here to protect your constituents in the city? Do you believe that the roost of falsely reporting on right-wing extremist activities and the abandonment of the East Precinct were the only ruses? and lies recently perpetrated by SPOG or SPD, we don't. We need full disclosure and specific swift and harsh consequences imposed with haste while we left with no other possible conclusion than the fact that our city and our public safety is being run by SPOG. We are emailing you a list of questions we hope are addressed with extreme urgency. One, are ruses or lies by the police ever acceptable if they could result in injury or death? How are their use in Seattle causing harm? Was there a cover-up? Two, why were texts deleted? Three, one, when did the city attorney's office know? When did the mayor know? Four, was there pressure on the Seattle Times to hold the story till after the election? Five, fog leadership seems to take an adversarial relationship to the mayoral power and control of the city. Will Mayor Harrow continue to look at this as a situation that needs compromise or admit that historically so-called good faith negotiations have failed? Thank you for... Um, the opportunity to speak today and please address this with urgency. Thank you, Laura. Our next speaker is Peter Condit and Peter will be followed by Fan and Fang. Peter? Hello, this is Peter in District 6. When the SPD engaged in their Proud Boys disinformation campaign, it was one tactic among many that they were using to suppress peaceful demonstration. People on the street, myself included, knew within a day that they had been lied to. We were being lied to all the time. Remember, around this time, a prohibition against tear gas was ignored in favor of just switching from one chemical irritant to another. The only thing that made the department stop aggression like this was when you, city council, began defunding SPD. Not reimagining and not retraining, defunding. For their part, what were the so-called accountability bodies doing? I honestly don't know. And it doesn't matter anyway because the individuals involved are not the problem, nor are they still employed in the department to face any consequences or accountability today. They knew well enough to quit or retire as soon as they could. Even the chief of police gaslighted Chair Herbold at the time by telling her not to believe the news. She did this in her professional capacity as a cop. This is what cops do. They are trained to lie. They cannot engage in good faith discussions about fixing their behavior because officers do not have the freedom to disobey a harmful order. 
It is not a problem with the individual people. It is a problem with the job description itself. This is what council may try to call, quote, traditional public safety. It is not. Cops are violence workers. Accountability through the budget is the only way forward. Defund SPD. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shannon Fang, and Shannon will be followed by Eric Ratchner. Shannon? Hi, my name is Shannon Chang. I am a District 7 constituent and part of a grassroots people power group focused on police accountability. I am speaking on the agenda item about the June 8, 2020 SPD ruse. Along with many others, I am deeply troubled by the OPA investigation into SPD's use of a ruse in the aftermath of their abandonment of the East Precinct. It is alarming that in an already strange situation, city employees ostensibly responsible for public safety decided to and carried out tactics to spread misinformation, escalate tensions, and create dangerous conditions on our streets. Even more upsetting is how high in the chain of SPD command responsibility for this incident lies and the unacceptable lengthy delay in making these investigation results public. City council members, I ask you to respond with urgency and use your powers of oversight over our city government to get to the bottom of how our system failed so dramatically. The specific questions previous commenter Royal Lowe outlined are excellent ones to address. We cannot continue to rely on the never ending consent decree process or the struggling accountability system. Otherwise circumstances like these will happen over and over again. Council members Herbold, Mosqueda, and Lewis in particular, I saw a live stream from summer 2020 where the three of you attended the protest. Please stand with the public again to bear witness to what is broken in our system so we can move forward to change it. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Our next speaker is Eric Rachner, and Eric will be followed by Desiree Delight. Eric? Yes, good morning. My name is Eric Rackner, and I, too, am calling to speak on the topic of the ruse and especially to vocalize my utter contempt for the credulity with which the explanations offered for it so far have been received. This was not, contrary to those explanations, an instance of a policing technique being misapplied to some situation for which it was perhaps not quite an appropriate fit. What actually occurred here was first the Seattle police vacated the East Precinct and completely suspended emergency public safety services in the neighborhood of the protest. And then having done that, they broadcast that a hostile group of armed adversaries was en route to the protest location with the explicit intention of seeking a confrontation with protesters. What possible foreseeable result could anybody have expected from that course of action? There's no tactical objective to be achieved here. They had already abandoned the neighborhood. There is no remotely plausible inference to be drawn here, other than that this was a deliberate choice by our police to create and then inflame the conditions for violence, which they did in a manner where the blame for what happened next could be fixed on protesters and, not incidentally, on city's political leadership. So I urge the committee to ask themselves, has there really been accountability for those involved has, has there been an honest assessment of what the objective of this ruse was and, and what took place? Because if this report from OPA is what passes for accountability for this police department, then it's beyond reform. It should be disbanded and replaced in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Desiree Delight, followed by Valerie Schlaret. Desiree? We have Desiree with us. Remember to hit star six, Desiree. Desiree, you're showing as uh, still muted. I, we need you to hit star six, please. If you can hear us. There you go. Hello? Oh, yeah. there we go. Sorry. Perfect. I'm That's new. all good. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm Des, and I used to be a Seattle homeowner. I also used to have a dream of uh, once reopening Seattle's infamous erotic bakery. But in 2020, I sold my home, I moved away, and I pulled the plug on those plans. And I want to tell you all how that hoax that played out on the night of June 8, 2020, added to my decisions to pull that plug. 
And I'd really love to go into detail about my personal experiences on the ground, June 8th, but I've been given such only two minutes here, so I just need to cut to the chase, and I'll be publishing the rest online if anyone wants to hear it. Um, So I guess we'll skip to all the important context stuff, and I'll just talk about the incident in question, and that being the hoax that SDD officers played on the very same public that they had just spent multiple days and nights brutalizing and gaslighting. A hoax that is now somehow divorced from everything prior to that night and conveniently forgotten when discussing everything that's come after. I read the OEPA report, and I paid attention to how Seattle city leadership has handled all of this. So I can see the bigger picture at play here, and it further cements my notion that I made the right decision to sell my home in October of 2020, change my address, vote in my hometown, and pull the plug on trying to reestablish my beloved Seattle relic. Because there's no way in this new hell I can see myself supporting a city that won't even take accountability for the very real, very reckless and immature actions of their police officers. Actions that led to real fear, real rumors, real guns, real armed security, and real deaths of real young people. We all can see that picture, right? So that's part of what I say when I'm saying CHOP was a setup to derail the BLM movement and delegitimize our calls to defame police as a whole. And it worked. And you continue to let it work. Stop it do better and then i might bring back your dick cakes that's all i want to say and also ice must be destroyed thank you thank you our next speaker is valerie Schlaret, and valerie will be followed by sanders lecturer valerie good morning <clears throat> i'm valerie Schlaret. the story about spd's proud boys ruse of june 2020 is not surprising nor is it surprising that the opa took so long to investigate it that the clock ran out on discipline In the meantime, we had local elections where policing was an enormous issue, but most of the public did not have the full story of police conduct during the protests. In August, an investigator in the Office of Inspector General made a detailed whistleblower complaint about the OIG's rubber stamping of OPA investigations. Issues related to the complaint have been investigated by Carolyn Bick in the South Seattle Emerald over the past five months. Dick's article of December 7 was investigating OIG complaint in city council's court, but SCC isn't acting. It reports that council members Herbold and Lewis declined to act when the OIG whistleblower gave them detailed information about egregious rubber stamping of OPA investigations. And further, that council member Herbold consulted with the OPA about what information to reveal to a journalist. In council briefing yesterday, council member Herbold said she will ask OIG to look again at the OPA investigation of the Proud Boys ruse. Since OIG is itself in question, having the OIG weigh in on its certification of this OPA investigation is not a solution. We're in an endless cycle of obfuscation and gaslighting. It's past time for council to do the right thing, instigate a fully independent and impartial investigation of the OIG and the OPA. Thank you, Valerie. Our next speaker is Saunders Lacture, followed by David Haynes. Good morning and Happy New Year. My name is Sanders and I live in District 7. I'm speaking on Agenda Item 1. The new police chief has not been confirmed yet and a new police squad contract has not been negotiated yet. The council has the responsibility to approve these items in the next year or so. Please demand more accountability items as recommended by the OPA, the OIG, and the CPC. Not doing so is repeating the cycle we've seen from the 2017 spot tra- contract. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Haynes. David, be followed by Char Smith. Good morning. Thank you. I want to address the ruse and public health. We have a public health crisis with a disease that spreads rapidly when sick vaccinated workers go back to work with no negative tests. This disease began to spread throughout nation because of Seattle and five other open border sanctuary, liberal cities where no confident strategy to stop the spread has ever been noted. It's all about chasing variants for big pharma profits at the expense of real public health where government officials have proven incompetent. Speaking of which, We also have a public safety crisis where society is imploding because city council thinks exempting evil drug pushers from jail who are committing crimes against humanity and getting listed nonviolent misdemeanor, destroying lives daily, imploding society, escalating violence is best practices. 
Yet city council has gone out of their way to appease devil's advocates of George Floyd protesters and BLM by browbeating cops, spending more time on making a mountain out of a molehill about a legalized ruse to remind CHOP that someone other than the cops, such as a Kyle Rittenhouse type of person, was going to show up to stop the violence in Capitol Hill. Yet there are bigger problems, such as an ill-trained, unqualified police chief and the civilian dispatch, where some are racist, woke, untrustworthy, playing politics during an emergency crisis. Recently, I called the cops a few times about all these evil criminals in my Pioneer Square neighborhood. And one time in the middle of the night, it sounded like a kidnapping at Pioneer Square. And the civilian dispatch said, we've already been down there an hour ago, and you've already called twice today, and I noticed you called last night, too. They're browbeating me because I called about all these horrible things that are going on. And during an emergency crisis, they go into budget politics. Perhaps we need to boycott Seattle if the city council is going to continue to implode our society. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Char Smith. Char will be followed by Bill Wilson. Hello, um, my name is Char Smith. I live in the South End. Uh, I am a teacher and I have the distinct privilege to be able to speak with you this morning because unfortunately teachers can't usually do that. Speaking to the ruse that was um, it's a strange word to use for it, but this information campaign that SPD played out in June 2020, I got to tell you, I don't have some prepared statement. I'm not here on behalf of some organization. I was just somebody in the streets because I want the cops to stop shooting my neighbors and stop shooting kids related to families related to my students. And when the precinct was abandoned. It was kind of assumed that the expectation was a setup, but when reports came in that there were groups of Proud Boys coming into the area, I think it's pretty understandable that a lot of people's reaction was to then bring guns into the Capitol Hill neighborhood because the police were very clear and have always been clear that they will do nothing to prevent uh, right-wing agitators from harming protesters. For the people who had just been getting gassed and getting beaten, um, that was a rough moment. And it is my hope, although definitely not my belief, that the city council will act in some meaningful way to take money away from SPD because that is the only thing that prevents this sort of behavior in the future. I really hope y'all have some semblance of accountability plan that is meaningful because in my entire lifetime, I've never seen anything close to that. Best of luck. Thank you, Char. Our next speaker, Bill Wilson, is showing as not present. So we'll move down to Eric Salinger. Eric? Hi, um, I hope you guys can. My name is Eric Salinger. I live in District 7. Uh, I've called a number of times about the SPD response. Uh, I, I think that there are a few things here which, which are kind of missing from this discussion. Um, and I just want to be clear that, like, the, the protest ruse uh, is, is I know that OPA has to investigate it as a small part of a larger thing. But I, I want to be clear about something here, which is I wasn't involved in these protests, except I would watch people march by my home and I would see a massively disproportionately militarized police response to peaceful protests. I remember that the mayor got on TV, and I think some of the people who were in this meeting were also in that press conference and told us that the Proud Boys were coming. I remember watching protests around this country and seeing how people who committed violence against Black Lives Matter protesters just kind of seemed to get away scot-free from whatever happened, both in Seattle and in other places. I remember there was an incident where someone, I believe, related to a police officer, drove their car into a group of protesters, and they were just peacefully arrested and taken into custody. There's a lot of context which OPA says they can't really look at when they're doing these investigations because they need to be impartial. 
But I think that a lot of that context is, is really critically important. When, when you're spreading rumors that there are an armed group of insurgents in downtown with guns, as someone who lives downtown and who just wants to walk his dog, I'm worried because those people might mess with me. I'm not involved in the protest, but now there are a bunch of armed people with guns. And I just watched downtown burn while the police department took a hands-off approach. I just watched the police department abandon a precinct. And earlier that year, I watched a mass shooting happen with the people arrested to Las Vegas. So the, the ramifications of this stuff go way beyond just protesting and into the fact that, like, people's lives get directly impacted. So thank you for your time. I, I hope you guys do something. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, with that, that concludes our public comment for this morning. Thank you all for for um, taking time out of your days to, um, to come and join us and share your thoughts about today's agenda. Um, just want to get things started here. Um, as I as I mentioned, we're going to try to um, keep the uh, timing on these these items as tight as possible. Will the clerk please read in agenda item one? Agenda item number one, OPA investigation into June 8th, 2020 rules. Thank you so much. Can we just start with a quick round of introductions, just your name and your affiliation uh, for everybody who's here presenting on this item this morning? Thank you. Um, I, I will, um, if somebody could just, just get started, maybe uh, Senior Deputy Harrell, you want to get started with the introductions, if you're with us? Hi, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to join today. Uh, I am looking forward to, um, uh, to hearing the updates and um, to working with council to find real solutions to some of these challenges we're facing right now. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brandy Grant. I'm the executive director of the Community Police Commission. I also want to um, thank you all for inviting me today. Um, I look forward to hearing the briefing and posing some simple questions um, and hopefully being able to work in collaboration with you all to also come up with solutions um, to this situation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Andrew Meyerberg from OPA. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I uh, want to recognize that Council President Orris has joined us this morning. Thank you, Council President Orris, for being with us here today. Um, so just some very, very quick uh, introductory remarks as time's limited. Uh, the case that we're going to discuss today, I believe, raises two sets of issues. First, how ruses, which are legal under state law, um, uh, are, are, are implemented um, and I, for one, believe that ruses need additional supervisor re oversight. It must be documented. We only know about this case in an early earlier 2029 case because of uh, constituent and media investigations. Um, oversight um, is an important issue. I've contacted both the Office of the Inspector General and OIG is working to ensure that policy changes address concerns raised by these cases and is also raising important questions of whether despite state law making ruses legal, whether or not a renewed look at their efficacy is needed. The second issue is one of public trust um, addressed in the report, which includes that the use of, ruse, of the ruse resulted in fear and alarm among community members who contacted uh, me that evening about the use of the ruse uh, resulting in my reaching out to then Chief Best. On the process for discipline for sustained findings, there is a meeting um, at OPA with SPD management and the city attorney to discuss this case. If there is the need for further investigation and what the appropriate range, uh, range of discipline should be, they, um, they, they discuss that. Um, that meeting did take place yesterday and the next step will be to present the case to the chief. They are seeking to do that this week. Uh, last week, SPD noted to my office, the chief will not have much to say before he um, 
can um, can go through this process to avoid any future appeal issues uh, about uh, presupposing his findings before the completion of the process. Um, so just um, if, if you're um, wondering about the absence um, of the chief here this morning, that is because of um, his um, uh, efforts, appropriate efforts to make sure that um, he does not speak to issues that then again could be used to um, appeal um, uh, possible um, discipline and, and findings coming out of this case. I want to thank Director Meyerberg for being here to present. And um, as we heard in introductions, we're also joined by both Senior Deputy Mayor Monisha Harrell and the CPC Executive Director Brandy Grant. Um, if there are um, no further opening remarks, I think we'll just um, get right into the presentation uh, from Director Meyerberg. I'd like to leave as much time as possible for questions. Um, and uh, for questions that we're not able to get to, we can of course work to um, compile them and um, send them on afterwards. Um, so if there are no objections, I'm just gonna hand it over to Director Meyerberg. Great, thank you very much. Um, I will keep, um, what I wanted to do was to give an overview of how this case came to us and how we investigated it and then um, again, like Councilmember Herbold said, is to leave as much time as we possibly can for questions because I know there are a lot of them here from the group. So um, we first learned of this case in November of 2020, and that's when it was flagged um, for us by Omari uh, Salisbury. Initially, it was a request to our office from Omari about um, whether or not there was any video showing the Proud Boys in the vicinity of City Hall, Volunteer Park, um, and in uh, going to the CHOP area. Immediately after receiving that inquiry, we did a search um, basically for all radio traffic and body-worn video that were recorded um, that may have showed anything regarding the Proud Boys and nothing was located. We communicated back and forth with um, Mr. Salisbury asking him if he had any additional information. He did not. Um, at that point, we, because of the lack of information, we initiated a full investigation. So this case um, was challenging in a number of respects. First of all, there, and as Councilmember Herbold had flagged, there was a lack of documentation. So there was no documentation that a ruse or any sort of misinformation or disinformation effort had been used, first of all. Second of all, there was no after action report or any sort of um, accounting of who was involved, who supervised it. Um, anything. In fact, there was simply an absence of evidence aside from a audio recording that was provided to OPA. So um, ultimately what we ended up doing was we spoke to as many people as we could within the department and we were uh, informed by someone in the intelligence unit that there may have been this effort that was run through SPOC, which is the Seattle Police Operations Center. After receiving that information, we reached out to SPOC. Um, what SPOC informed us was that yes, this may have occurred and that it was supervised um, and commanded by named employee one. Once we received that information, we started to narrow down the investigation and we interviewed him. As part of that interview, he gave a general overview of, of what the effort was and why it was done. He also identified an officer who was named employee two in our case summary, who was involved in coordinating the ruse um, and bringing officers on to participate in it. We then interviewed that officer. He identified other officers that may have been involved. And we began a process of interviewing officers, playing them the audio recording, having them identify their voices, and if they could, to identify other officers as well. We ended up conducting, I believe, over 10 interviews with a number of officers. Some we were able to identify were not on the audio recording, um, but ultimately we were able to identify nearly all the officers that were on the audio recording. Um, again, we're, we were very hamstrung with this investigation because we don't have a list of the officers. Um, and if the, the ones that we're playing audio for can't identify the other officers or in some respects won't identify officers, unfortunately, we're stuck with that information. We have no way to match up voices against the, you know, the 700 other patrol officers that are within the Seattle Police Department. So we were, um, in some respects, stuck with the information that we received during the course of the investigation. 
once we were able to identify all the officers, at least that we could, that were that were involved in um, the effort, we interviewed each of them and asked them, you know, what were you told? What were you instructed? Um, what guidance were you given? How was it supervised? And what became very clear was that the answer was that um, there was virtually no supervision or guidance that was provided to any of the officers. This ruse or this effort was generically created by named employee one, um, who did not provide significant supervision to named employee two, who in turn did not provide significant supervision to all the other officers. Um, there were other officers that did um, use misinformation as well um, during the course of subsequent days. However, that information was generally talking about movies they had watched or what food they had eaten. There was no other ruse that was the same as the, the Proud Boy language that was used on June 8th. Um, so that's why we focused our investigations on uh, named employee one, named employee two, and the officers that were involved in that aspect of the ruse. In evaluating this case, um, you know, we certainly we felt that, um, and I don't want to mince words, that this was a, a really poor decision um, from all aspects of SB officers involved in this case. I mean, I don't, I don't know that there's any way around that. It was, it was a, a bad idea not just to use disinformation and that I don't know if it was necessary, but also to use the Proud Boys as part of that misinformation. I think what was clear was that um, the East Precinct had just been walked away from. A Chaz Chop was being formulated. Tensions were high within Chaz Chop. Prior to the ruse being learned about, folks had already brought firearms into Chaz Chop. And of course, there was a possibility that things could become escalated. So in our minds, using that ruse um, served, and again, as we said in the DCM, to pour fuel in the fire to take a already heightened situation to make it even more so. Um, so I wanted to discuss really quickly um, the policy recommendations. Um, one thing that Councilmember Herbold had flagged was the lack or the absence of a policy recommendation that was part of our case summary. One thing I think is important to note is that um, we use the ruse policy because it was the best fit for this case, but really this isn't a true ruse. Really, this is a misinformation, disinformation campaign. I think the closest policy is the ruse, and that's why we evaluated it under the ruse policy. I do think that there is significant merit in reevaluating the policy from top to bottom. Right now, what the policy does is it defines the, the times that a ruse can be used, and that's consistent with state law. What it doesn't do is it doesn't provide guidance as to what types of ruses can be used. What can you say? What can you not say? How should you document it? Um, and that was one thing that we had pushed for from our 2019 case, which um, I think you all remember, which was the Porter Feller case um, that tragically resulted in his suicide. One of the things that we had recommended as a result of that case was that all officers receive training on exactly this, using the Porter Feller case as an example. Here's when you should be using a ruse and here's when you should not be. SPD did require training, but it was done through roll calls and not through a training module or training class, which is what we suggested to ensure uniformity of the training. I've spoken to SPD and I know Councilmember Herbold has as well. Um, I believe that they are in progress of revamping the policy. Um, I, I don't know whether they'll go so far as to ban ruses, but I do think that they are going to include new parameters around ruses when they can be used and certainly a documentation requirement. With regard to the documentation in this case, um, that it wasn't documented anywhere. I think that was. Sounds like we're having a little bit of connectivity problems. Um, that's a, um, and I don't know if I gloss over anything, but I'm happy to turn this over to folks for questioning or to cede time to um, to Ms. Grant or to Senior Deputy um, Mayor uh, Harold. Director Meyerberg, can you just restate your um, the last point that you made? Um, I don't know if others were having Sorry a problem, but I was having some- Starting with regarding documentation. Yeah, so um, I was surprised. One of the things that was surprising for us in this case was the absence of documentation, given that the ruse was officially sanctioned or the effort was officially sanctioned by members of the chain of command, it was done as part of, you know, demonstration management. 
generally we would expect those types of things to have been documented in an after action report or in some official log to say this is what was done and these are the people that participated in it. Um, and the fact that that was not done resulted in a finding, a sustained finding, because of the expectation that that would be completed. Um, I do think that there is significant merit in requiring any time a ruse is going to be used to have it documented. I don't think it would be overly complicated to do so. Um, I also don't think that, um, to our point, OPA has to issue a management action for that to occur. SPD can and should be reinventing and changing its policies all the time. And I think this is something where on their own motion, they should be changing and, and modifying, and I believe that they are. Thank you so much. Um, before we open it up for questions, um, I, I will wanna give um, Senior Deputy Mayor Harrell and CPC Director Grant an opportunity to, um, to speak, and then we'll open up for questions. But even before we get to that, Dr. Meyerberg, um, because there have been questions raised about the thoroughness um, of the investigation. Can you just kind of run through quickly what the investigation consisted of? Sure. Um, so basically what we did here was we looked at, we, we, first of all, we analyzed the audio recording that was provided to us. We didn't have access at that point to other audio recordings. I think what we later learned was that there was a longer audio recording that had, I mean, we listened to it, I think up to 10 15 or 10 30 p.m but there was an audio recording that went up to midnight where two other call signs were used by unknown officers um so that was something that we were not aware of um it may very well be the case that it was the same officers that used those call signs um what i would say is that we asked every single officer we brought in we asked whose voices do you hear and who was involved in the effort and what we were in, we received what we believe that was a full accounting of those folks. However, given the existence of additional video, um, we're open to um, doing a further inquiry to bring the officers back in and to ask them about that is to say, do you recognize any other voices? The reality is though, just like with our initial investigation, we are in many ways stuck with what we get from the officers. If they say, no, we don't recognize someone or um, or they don't disclose any more names, which I don't expect will occur with the ones we previously interviewed. Um, we don't, there's no other documentation, there's no other records, there's no other um, materials that we can use to cross reference and to figure that out. So I definitely think that that was um, perhaps the biggest gap in the investigation, but one that we are happy to keep looking at and to remedy. With regard to the other aspects of the, of the investigation, I would say that it was complete um, and thorough, and obviously, as we've discussed, was certified by the OIG as such. Um, you know, I think the other criticism that I've seen of the investigation, and I think it has merit, is that it's solely kind of focused on the, the this ruse instead of looking at kind of the broader picture of misinformation or disinformation provided by um, SPD or allegedly provided by SPD. And from our perspective, that's for a reason. Our investigations are focused on individual incidents. We don't look at you know, a series of incidents and to have that make it more likely or less likely than the incident that we're looking at occurred or didn't occur. Um, from our perspective, that is much better suited to the Office of Inspector General or for that matter, the CPC, which are more systemic bodies that can do those assessments. I believe that right now the OIG is conducting its stage two um, uh, Sentinel Vet review uh, assessment and, and which deals with Chaz Chop. And I what I would also assume is that this finding and this investigation, as well as um, the disinformation used in and around Shaz Shah will be central to that um, Sentinel Vet review. Um, and then I think if there are additional questions after that Sentinel Vet review, certainly I think um, the council will be situated well to, to address those and to evaluate them. Thank you, Chair Marburg. Uh, Senior Deputy Mayor uh, Harrell, would you um, share some of your thoughts? with us and your observations. Yes, absolutely. Um, and um, and I, I apologize, um, they are not gonna be quite as, quite as organized, <clears throat> um, but I just wanna make a couple points. Um, one of which is, um, you know, I, like many others, was made aware of this case uh, through an article in the Seattle Times. Um, and this was daylighted for investigation by Converge Media and other sources on the ground. And um, that cannot be how we operate. 
Um, I believe that if we truly want accountability uh, within our system, um, we can't be allowed to have these facts obscured. And um, I, um, I can only share that um, for any amount of legitimacy of the system, we have to be focused on accountability and transparency. And it does bother me a tremendous amount that there was um, no documentation uh, uh, for Mr. Meyerberg's presentation. There was no documentation around uh, what was happening. And truly, if this were um, if this were a legitimate operation, there would have been documentation around it. It would have it wouldn't have taken outside sources to daylight it. It um, it would have been part of um, our after actions. Uh, as a city around what happened around Chop Chaz. So uh, I'm somewhat relieved with the what happens in the dark will come to light. Uh, I look forward to working with the council um, to be able to figure out how this doesn't happen again in the future. Um, but also have to admit that um, this really doubles down on our desire to need to dig deeper um, to dig deeper to the things that uh, we didn't even um, that we did not know were occurring and to ensure that um, we dig deep enough to to fix um, what is uh, what is rotten here. So um, I want to thank you for um, allowing me to have a few moments today. I want to thank you for um, um, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, I know that the council will be partners in working with us on this. Um, and I know that this is not gonna be easy work, but I know we have to do it on behalf of the city. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for, for being here with us. And I, I too look forward to um, problem solving around this and um, in other areas. Um, just be, I, I see Council Member Lewis that you are first in the queue uh, for questions. I do wanna give um, Director Grant an opportunity um, to say a few words as well though, because I know that ruses have long been um, a concern of the Community Police Commission. Um, I believe there was a, um, a meeting that, um, a public meeting, a CPC public meeting at the uh, end of last year where this was a topic of discussion, maybe not specifically this this case, but um, the, the policy around, around ruses um, and just really want to um, give Director Grant an opportunity to um, uplift some of, some of their concerns and questions um, around this. And I, and I know they have some, some pending requests of the police department um, as well. So Director Grant. All right, thank you, um, Council Member Herbold. Um, also too, just wanna concur again, thank you for inviting us here. I also wanna thank the public commenters who spoke today. I only really have a few additional questions because the points that they brought up um, were so pertinent to many of the things that the CPC has already shared um, in previous documentation that we had sent around. Um, I think, you know, um, Director Meyerberg, a couple things for me and the CPC, um, the, the point of clarification around the absence of evidence early on, I think my biggest question would be, you know, per OPA procedures, when there is a lack of evidence or there's absence of it early on, what type of steps are you all taking to um, make sure that findings are validated, you have enough information and in how you're going about those processes? Um, are, is there thoughts and plans of what you all will do when cases like this arise in the future? And then I think too, it would also be really helpful to have a better understanding of the misinformation versus disinformation and ruses. To me, this was in fact just that, a ruse. Um, so the, the clarity around that um, particular sentence, I would love to be able to hear a bit, uh, hear a bit more about, but one of the biggest questions that the CPC had was, um, you know, from the complaint to the chief's desk to um, beyond that, why was the complaint so far beyond the 180 days? Why did it take so long for this to be reviewed? A case of this magnitude, is there a priority system that you all are gonna put in place when cases of this nature come across your desk? Um, I feel like it was really disheartening to have, even though I'm thankful, for uh, Mr. Salisbury, um, uh, uh, the deputy mayor is completely correct. We should not have had to have that di daylighted uh, by um, a journalist who had also incurred a lot of the trauma from that particular day amongst community members. Um, I would really love to hear what, um, what, why it took so long 
And then if there are going to be cases where it is going to take that long, we should really be considering the negative impact of um, what those particular findings are going to be when they are delayed. And then what commitment do you have um, to community to make sure that we're informed in some aspect along the way? If there are delays, problematic findings, um, issues that arise, I feel like it is time for us to go back and look at um, what, the, what the procedures are that are put in place. It was extremely traumatic, the events that took place, um, and to have almost now going into, honestly, year two, um, for us to still be talking about this with no actual conclusion or solution is very troublesome. Um, and I do have many other questions to follow up on, but I am completely comfortable with making sure that council also gets to ask their questions. Uh, the commission will be following up with um, some more informational requests that we have um, after this meeting concludes. So um, again, I just wanna thank you, but I wanna put those things on your mind, Dr. Director Meyerberg and council. Um, I hope you all also work in tandem with us to make sure um, that they are taking the situation um, uh, seriously, so we can um, so we can make sure that it never happens again. Thank you, Director Meyerberg. Before I open it up to council members, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I can respond to them. I, I think there was three questions. I'll respond as I, I think I heard and, and can respond to them. Um, so, for cases that have a lack of lack of documentation, I mean, I would say it's rare that we would have this type of a case where there was a high level decision made to use. Um, a ruse or, or whatever you want to refer to it where there would be no documentation. So this is pretty rare. There were other cases that stem from the protests where, for example, we knew that someone was uh, subjected to police force, but we just couldn't find them because we didn't have a description. We were never able to speak to them and we would have to look through body worn video and we're just looking for a needle in a haystack and we just had a lot of difficulty locating them. But this type of a case where there's just simply no documentation of again, a high-level high effort is abnormal. Sorry, I think I was out for a little bit, but I'm saying certainly we can come up with ways or protocols to um, address this type of a case moving forward. But again, it's this is very, very rare. I've never seen anything quite like it before, and I don't know whether we'll see it again, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have plans in place to address that. Um, with regard to your second question, um, I guess the distinction I was making about a ruse versus like a misinformation or disinformation effort is that generally when you think of a ruse, a ruse occurs in the context of a criminal investigation. For example, during an interrogation, someone says, well, you know, well, we have your fingerprints on this um, cup. What do you say to that? Like that is, in my mind, a true ruse where this was more of a formal effort that was done, organized by the chain of command. Um, so it, I, maybe it's a, an issue of scope where I'm referring to it as an effort, misinformation effort versus a ruse. Um, but again, both are the same in which you're providing false information to achieve a law enforcement goal. So I think you could address both through the same policy, but I would be careful to say within the policy, if you're going to make that change is to refer to both is to not just talk about ruses as a patrol officer would think about them, but also think about sanction disinformation efforts and potentially consider banning that altogether, even if you keep allowing ruses to occur. Um, with regard to the last question, the I think it raises two really important questions. Um, first is the timing of the investigation. Um, what I would say is that um, the, the investigation started in December when we realized that we had no information and we needed to open up an investigation. So we started it in December of 2020. Um, when we proceeded through the investigation, for much of the investigation, we did not have named employees, meaning that we didn't know who was involved. So we spent a lot of time trying to assess who was involved, who made the statements, what statements were made. Um, and then during the course of the investigation, we started to identify folks and to put them in as named employees. The investigator on that case, and again, this is just purely resource issues that are important to note, but the investigator on that case, because the first named employee was a captain and then an assistant chief, pursuant to the SPMA contract, our investigator had to be a supervisor. In OPA, we have two supervisors, and that's the same supervisor that was working on the East Precinct case that was helping work on the January 6th case that was supervising you know, nearly 100 other cases and had a full caseload. So simply because of bandwidth, that supervisor is doing the best that that person can, but no one else is allowed to work on that case, again, based on contracts. Once we 
finish the investigation, meaning that we identified as many people as we identified, wrote it up, we provided it to the OIG, and then they returned it to us with a certification. There was another delay on the back end with the writing of the findings. Part of that is because I was out on paternity leave for 30 days um, and was unable to write the case up during that time. The other part of it is that, you know, during the 60 business days or so that I was in the office, I had to personally write up between 80 and 85 other cases. Um, and again, pursuant to ordinance, I have to write up individually each one of those cases. And that involved looking at hundreds of hours of video, hundreds of documents. And again, that's not an excuse. I'm, I'm not thrilled about the delay in the case. I wish I'd gotten it out sooner, but it's just a simple reality of the workload that um, we have at OPA and that I personally have as the director, just based on my job description. Um, so, but to your second point, which I think is important, Director Grant, is can we create some sort of a mechanism to, I mean, we do have a priority mechanism insofar as generally we focus on sustained cases that have pending 180 day deadlines. The named employees, the two named employees for, to whom received sustained findings retired during the course of the investigation. So the 180 day no longer was applicable for them. That being said, it still was a matter of public concern. And that is obviously my frustration about not getting it done sooner. Um, but certainly I'd be happy to talk to the commission about how we prioritize cases. And if you have ideas and how we can make notifications to the public about cases that may be coming up, what those cases would involve, I'd like to hear it. We do use our dashboard, which is our general kind of outline of the cases that are pending, particularly from the protests. But, you know, maybe there is a better way to do it um, to avoid, like you said, the re-traumatization. Um, and again, I'm, I regret that in some respects it's unavoidable, but I do regret that that occurred. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you, Director Meyerberg. Um, Councilmember Lewis, thank you so much for, for your patience. I recognize you've had your hand up in the queue for a while. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. It, it's it's good to be back here on the committee in, in 2022 and uh, certainly welcome Councilmember Nelson and, and welcome uh, Senior Deputy Mayor Manisha Harrell. Um, really appreciate your partnership as we dive into this. Uh, just to, to jump in a little, to start with some table setting, you know, whenever we go back to the events of, uh, you know, the summer of, of 2020, which, I mean, for everybody was a, a really challenging time and just want to make space for that and acknowledge that, like one of the documents that I keep going back to, and I think it's just grounding for our conversation today, as we seek accountability for police actions that occurred during that time, is Judge Jones' temporary restraining order. And, you know, just as table setting, I go back to that whenever we're, we're doing a hearing like this for, for the section where, you know, Judge Jones determined that the use of force and the tactics SPD was using would chill a person of ordinary firmness from protesting. Uh, Judge Jones agreed with the plaintiffs and said they had a strong likelihood of success that SPD specifically targeted protesters because they were protesting the police, that the police used tactics and a level of force that was motivated by being more extreme and harsher because of the topic of the speech that the protesters were using. I, I go back to those because I think when we have these conversations, we need to really center what we're talking about and looking at this, this whole episode in our history that we had a department that was engaged in really concerning activity. And, and the questions that I have today about this investigation as one episode in a whole bunch of episodes that led an Article Three judge, you know, appointed by a president, confirmed by the U.S. Senate, to say that our police department was being specifically brutal to protesters because they were protesting the police. I, I just want us to keep that in mind on the importance of getting to the bottom of, of some of these episodes. And I want to start maybe, Director Meyerberg, if you could just give a little bit more background on um, the SPOC, which was the body where this particular tactic was run through, just so the audience and, and every, everyone on the committee knows the role of that body. Because I have a couple questions related to that, but I just want to make sure we're all working from the same baseline. Yeah, uh, SPOC is is a is the Special Operations Center. It's located in the West Precinct, and generally during demonstrations, that's kind of the command center for SPD's operations. Yeah. So my my question is, because from reading about this in in the Seattle Times, um, from like reviewing the the OPA report, there's there's been a lot of 
coverage that this operation that was run through Spock was apparently not known to anyone but Captain Grennan. That Captain Grennan conceived of this operation. Captain Grennan decided he was going to run this operation to, in, in his mind to de-escalate tensions by um, deceiving demonstrators into thinking there, there was a protest. And I guess my comment is, or my question um, for Director Meyerberg would be, based on your kind of knowledge and understanding of the department, is it common that the chief, the mayor, assistant chiefs wouldn't know that this operation was occurring? Well, I would say, I would say nothing about this case is common. I think that's just kind of uh, uh, at the outset. I think that's the reality. Um, I, I, it's really difficult to answer, right? Because I've never seen that happen. I've never seen this happen before. Um, you know, we spoke to the chief, we spoke to the assistant chief of patrol or the former chief of police and all said that they did not know about the specifics of the operation that was ongoing. Um, uh, uh, name employee one was at that time running Spock. Is it possible that um, information was um, was not shared and was kept within Spock within his purview? It's possible, um, but but it's but it, it, I have no indication that the accounts that were given to our our investigator were inaccurate, meaning about the investigate what was known by those folks. But but I can't answer that question because I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, I, I guess just as a general concern, if it was one incident where people didn't know what was going on with their commanders and with people on the ground, like I could get that. But there's now a number of data points from our sort of um, ad hoc examination of, of some of these specific incidents where people didn't know what was going on and things bubbled up into being horrifying violations of the rights of people in the city. Uh, you know, the abandonment of the East Precinct, apparently no one knew about that except Assistant Chief Mahaffey and no one above Assistant Chief Mahaffey was aware of it. Uh, you know, and it, there's been some different accounts based on some of the reporting that we've seen from KUOW and some other speculation in the community. But, but these dots start to connect a pattern where during this time period, we're just hearing an awful lot of people in the high command didn't know about things. And people in the middle management command level were making big decisions that had big impacts. And Nobody knew. And I guess my concern is at what point should people have known and are there consequences for people not making themselves aware of these things that were happening? If, if they're in a position of that level of authority and command over the police service in the city. I mean, certainly it's a concern. We articulated that same concern in our DCM about the East Precinct case. I mean, the fact that there was this confusion or this disagreement between folks about who knew what and when, and then a failure to communicate out to community and media, public officials and others immediately afterwards when they knew um, what had occurred, I think was a problem. I think we had flagged this issue in other cases and in our August 2020 report that went out to the council that there appeared to be this disconnect between command staff, like high level command staff, and then these middle supervisors, like lieutenants and captains about tactics and what would be done and how would it be, we do the, how it would be done. Um, it certainly was chaotic, but yes, I would expect like you do as well, that there would be more coordination, communication and understanding by high level command staff of what was going on under them. And it's a problem that that didn't occur. But, you know, when you say, so you've said it at least, I think three times today, Director Meyerberg, that this operation was organized by chain of command, mm -hmm. right? So when I hear organized by chain of command, it sounds like that chain is starting with Captain Grennan, which seems pretty far down the chain of command. So is that what you, when you're saying that in your presentation, is that what you mean by chain yeah, of command? That's what I mean. Captain I mean, Grennan the, on down? Yeah, the chain of command is what I mean is by Captain Grennan down. I have no indication from the investigation that we did that it was organized by someone else other than Captain Grennan. And again, Grennan was shortly thereafter promoted to an assistant chief. Um, he was in a supervisory position over Spock. It was very much the case that um, because of what was going on and all the moving parts that were happening, that people in the captain's role received, again, high level assignments just like this. But on that day, who would have been above Grennan in the chain of command? It, it, 
depends. If it's Spock, theoretically, it could have been, it may have been Assistant Chief Herjack at that point. It may have been whoever was running special operations. It could have been Assistant Chief Greening. I'm not totally sure who was heading that bureau. Again, you know, Assistant Chief Mahaffey was running patrol operations, which this didn't fall under. Um, so, but, but there's a lot of, again, confusion. There's people that are doing a multitude of different things. So again, it's not necessarily that clear as to who Brennan would have reported to directly, or if he would have reported it to anyone. And again, that may be part of the problem or a significant part of the problem. Yeah. So um, if we reopen this, it, sorry, Councilmember, Brown, just, just real quick and I'll wrap up, but um, <laughs> like if this gets reopened, maybe we establish what the entire chain of command was, because the sense I just get is that when we're saying chain of command, it sounds like this is starting from the middle of the chain of command and going down. And I just think that's an important kind of issue mapping for this mm -hmm. in terms of determining who should have known. Uh, like we know who did know and we, we have representations of people saying they didn't know. I guess my question is like who should have known and what the implication is going forward for how these kinds of things are organized. One last implication to that is I, I think that Chief Interim Chief Diaz um, has sort of set a precedent for should have knowing in terms of how that factors into discipline because with the pink umbrella incident, and I know this wasn't an OPA recommended finding, but my understanding is the premise of Assistant Chief Herjack's demotion was Assistant Chief Herjack should have known Lieutenant Brooks was going to unconstitutionally tear gas a bunch of people and should have intervened and didn't. Therefore, Assistant Chief Herjack was demoted. It seems like by that standard of chain of command that's being applied, there should be more that's happening with how this ruse is dealt with to be consistent which is why I'm focusing on the chain of command and how that is relevant to this fact pattern. Um, it, it just seems like, I, you know, I, I'm tired of being in a position where I'm reading in the news about the latest thing that comes out of 2020 and everything gets fobbed off on a mid-level person. Everyone that's above, you know, that was in the mayor's office or the front office of SPD claims they didn't know about it. And, some guy in the middle gets gets hit with everything and all the responsibility and you know I, I just i just don't know if that's an effective way to run a hierarchical organization or to center accountability and responsibility for the actions of a department yeah you know i'm not sure i mean again i'm not sure um you know exactly how to respond what i will say is that you know the you know, a captain is is obviously one level behind an assistant chief who then is, you know, there's no deputy chief in the Seattle Police Department. So that's just one tier below an assistant chief and then the chief. So a captain's fairly high up the chain of command. But I don't think that that changes your overall point is that there are a number of cases in which um, actions are engaged in by, um, again, even if it's high level commanders where the very top of the chain of command said that they did not have awareness of the case. And obviously that is a concern. Um, and one that I'm hoping that interim chief Diaz will rectify. Thank you, Dr. Meyerberg. I do want to give other folks an opportunity to ask questions. We are going to have to wrap up in five minutes. Um, I appreciate the line of questioning though, Councilmember Lewis, I like you um, am, have been frustrated by the number of um, we didn't knows um, that have come out in this investigation and others. Um, just looking for uh, raised hands from um, Members, uh, Member Nelson, yes, please. I don't want to speak at a turn. I did see Councilmember Peterson had his hand up. So oh, I did not see that. I'm sorry. Councilmember Peterson. Thank you, Chair Herbold. I concur with the line of questioning that Councilmember Lewis asked. So rather than repeat that, I'll just look forward to uh, hearing what. Um, Obviously, this happened under the previous administration, but we're looking forward to seeing the new administration um, provide that, that level of oversight with the police department that's necessary. Thank you. Back to you, Councilmember Nelson. Thank you very much for this detailed um, presentation. I actually also, um, like Senior Deputy Mayor Harrell, learned about this in the Seattle Times. So. Um, 
I'm bringing myself up to speed on the process of investigations in SPD. And I just have a question about, um, so when was the investigation done? And when did the IG uh, sign off on the investigation? And then when, and, and when, um, Dr. Meyerberg, did you forward it on for potential action? Uh, and when did the leadership of SPD know about this, these allegations and your findings? Because in, um, in Council Member Herbold's preview of this uh, session today, uh, she mentioned um, accountability and also potential consequences, which um, I uh, run out in 180 days, I imagine, after, you know, there is a timeline when those um, can be recommended. And so, and there were in public comment allegations that uh, there was a purposeful running out of the clock. So that is sort of the, the timeline that I'm interested. When was the uh, investigation certified by the IG and uh, when was it forwarded by you to the powers that be? So the investigation was certified by the OIG in mid-September. Um, so I believe it was September 10th or September 12th was when it was certified. Um, however, prior to that point, so several months prior to that point, both named employee one and two had retired from the police department. Um, so at that point, once they retired, the 180 day deadline stopped moving for them. Um, so there is no 180 day deadline because they're not members of the police department. And there's no contractual bargaining agreement that applies to their actions. So um, at that point, we, um, we finished the DCM. So the DCM was finished in um, late December, was transmitted to the chain of command. And then there was disciplinary proceedings that were held in um, this week or the beginnings of the disciplinary proceedings. Okay. So there was a gap between September and December and now all of a sudden it's in a new administration's, it, okay. So I mean, it's, it's the same, I mean, I guess it's the same, as far as the administration goes, it's the same police department um, administration and that interim chief Diaz would have been the same chief that would have um, reached disciplinary findings had it been done in September versus in December. And at that point in September, both employees had already resigned from the department. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before we go back to council member uh, Lewis, who I see his hands up again, other council members who haven't asked a question yet. All right. Um, for uh, I, I am I, I have not asked a question, so I'm going to put myself in the queue here, Councilmember Lewis. Um, I just want to real real quickly touch on um, the uh, named employees. Uh, I believe it's three through six. Um, the named employees three through six um, are all um, findings that have been identified as allegation removed, um, and I'm just. Uh, curious a little bit about first the use of that um that finding for um for a um a claim that it appears in this instance you are sort of acknowledging um that there was a violation but you're removing the allegation or the you're removing the allegation because of um belief that uh above those those three um employees um, had responsibility. And I'm wondering um, whether or not it makes more sense to just rule on the facts of the case that there was a violation and then let the question of whether or not um, discipline for that violation, that that be a determination um, of, of uh, the police chief. Um, for the nature of policing, it seems like there are often situations that arise where officers have to use their discretion to address a difficult situation. And so um, the, the question is, is, you know, are they not expected to make all of their decisions consistent with SPD policy, utilizing discretion, quote, in proportion to the public safety issue addressed? Um, if a decision to reference a group of armed Proud Boys could be foreseen, to make a volatile situation worse, then why aren't the individual officers being held accountable, regardless of the supervision component, with a sustained violation, perhaps with a with a you know an acknowledgement that um, there is supervisory work that should have been done um, that wasn't done, and that that be considered as um, part of um, the 
uh, decisions around discipline. I'm just very concerned about the use of allegation removed while you're simultaneously, you seem to be saying um, that, the, the, that, the, that this would merit a sustained violation. Yeah, I, I, I definitely see the concern. I mean, from, I think fundamentally from, from my perspective at least is that um, obviously I think the decision to use the Proud Boys was a very, very poor decision. But I think fundamentally what it stems from is the failure of any supervision over these officers' actions. And the fact that there was no guidance, no parameters, there was nothing told to them about what they should or shouldn't do. Virtually all these officers said in their interviews that they had never had to do something similarly before. They didn't know what they were doing. Um, I really view that fundamentally as a command failure and not, and, and yes, and, and, and errors on the part of these officers and problems, but I lay the responsibility for this on the level of command. I mean, perhaps there's a better um, finding than allegation removed, but I don't think the appropriate finding for these officers, given the, actual, the lack of any support and basically being set up to fail, that the appropriate finding would be a sustained finding. I would just really urge um, your role to be really focused on fact finding of whether or not the violation of policy occurred, which you have done. You have determined that a violation of policy occurred, not just that, not that it was a bad idea or bad judgment, but that it was a violation of policy. Um, and I, you know, I support you in um, opining on whether or not somebody should be um, disciplined for a violation of policy if there's a failure of supervision. But I, um, again, I'm just I'm concerned that this particular set of findings goes um, with the allegation removed is is is. Um, out of the scope of just a fact finding of whether or not the um, the violation occurred. Council Member Lewis, you want to wrap us up? Yes, and this is just a really brief, uh, like evidentiary investigation question. Um, but Director Meyerberg, in doing your the this first round of the investigation, and if this gets gets looked at again, um, was there any information that OPA wanted to receive and they weren't able to that would have been helpful to make these conclusions? I mean, I think of the fact that, you know, it's been well publicized that a lot of relevant text messages uh, are missing from the police department uh, and other executive departments. And I just wonder if there were evidentiary issues that that would help to get to the bottom of this that you encountered. And if that's an area we should look into, if we look into this again. So as far as I'm aware, there were no evidentiary. Um, the only evidentiary issue that we have was the lack of any evidence, meaning the lack of any sort of documentation of what occurred and why it occurred. Um, we did email searches and other searches and no responsive information came back. And that's not a surprise given the nature of the effort. Um, you know, certainly we could do a text message search and I know that text messages have been collected and have been um, collected as part of other litigation. Um, but it was not necessarily something that we were at the time. Um, there was no evidence that we saw at the time that we didn't have aside from the lack of documentation around the Bruce. Thank you, Director Meyerberg. Um, so we, despite my, um, my efforts to keep us on time, this ran over, there's a great amount of interest. I really thank everybody for being here with us today. Um, I will um, certainly uh, forward on count, uh, questions that council members may have that didn't get um, asked and answered um, and uh, will offer to, to collect them on behalf of, of my colleagues to share them um, with um, Director Meyerberg and um, Chief Diaz as we move on in as appropriate, um, the Office of the Inspector General and the CPC. I know the, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's questions about how OIG determines sufficiency of the, of the investigation and I um, have received some additional information from the OIG about that that I will also share. With that, um, let's move on to the next item on the agenda. Thank you Thank again, you. everybody, for being with us. And a special thanks to uh, Senior Deputy Mayor Manisha Harrell for being with us. Alex, can you please uh, read the next item into the agenda? Committee item number two, public health update on COVID-19, briefing and discussion. Thank you so much. 
Uh, let's just start with a quick round of introductions of uh, presenters here with us today. I, I, I think I'm the only uh, presenter today. <laughs> so nice to see you all again. Um, and uh, thank you for the invite. This is, uh, I'm Dennis Worsham. I'm the Interim Director for Public Health Seattle King County. And uh, Council Member Herbold uh, asked me to come and do a presentation on where, where we're at with COVID. Thank you so much. Uh, why don't you just um, take it away? And um, if you have questions, we'll, we'll um, let you know if they are. Thank you. All right, great. I'm, I'm all right to share my screen. Please, I will yes. go there now. And um, so uh, can you see the screen from your great? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, as I said, I'm Dennis Warsham. I'm the interim director for Public Health Seattle King County um, and have been in my current role for uh, about seven months now. Uh, prior to that was the director for infectious diseases uh, and uh, heavily involved in our COVID response. Um, of course, this is not the news I want to be bringing. Uh, and I think we're feeling this across the city and uh, county and really across the country and globe at this point. Um, you know, after a couple of years of a, a pandemic and really in our response uh, of hard work um, from uh, all of us, uh, both in public health uh, for all of you and the electeds and what you're doing and our community partners, um, uh, people are fatigued, but uh, but are rising to the occasion of what we need to do here with our uh, with our current surge uh, in place. I uh, just want to. Um, um, go over some data slides with you. I think that these are always good pictorials and really kind of painting a picture of where, of where we're at. Uh, to date, uh, here in King County, we have had 248,755 positive cases of COVID, 9,950 um, uh, 9, hospitalizations, 2,100 and 96 deaths. So uh, it's really taken a toll on our community all the way around. Uh, we've got good news in here, but we also have some challenging news, uh, news of where we're at. So in the um, current surge uh, that all of you uh, have been reading about and, and know about already about Omicron is a, a variant of concern that was detected in Africa just only a, about a month ago. And uh, remarkable how um, and overwhelming how quickly it has come in and just uh, taken over. Our UW colleagues who do a lot of modeling uh, believe that about 90% of our local COVID uh, cases now uh, are coming from our uh, Omicron variant uh, here. So it's come in pretty strong. We had Delta before that, uh, that uh, uh, was, was, was difficult, but Omicron is uh, carrying much more uh, transmissibility and uh, higher impacts of uh, disease in our community. Uh, for our seven day average uh, that we uh, put in these markers here in the screen in front of you, uh, we are now at this incredible high uh, seven day uh, daily average of 4,614 uh, cases per day. That's four times higher than our previous peak, was, which is back in November of 2020 before we had vaccines, and about 12 times higher than what we saw in Delta uh, in early December of 2021. So huge increases uh, of where, where, we're, where we're at currently. Uh, as we know, uh, when we're looking at our, our data is we're actually seeing transmission increase among all ages. And uh, in particular, our highest among our 18 to 24 year olds followed by 25 to 34 and uh, five to 17 year olds uh, in, in the third uh, ranking of that. So really uh, among uh, uh, folks who are younger uh, probably and uh, as you can imagine, uh, higher circulation in our community uh, and uh, some of our lower vaccine rates in those age groups uh, as we're getting up to speed in some of those areas. Uh, case counts and incidence rates, you know, as we look about race and ethnicity groups have also increased, uh, really highest among our native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population, uh, followed by Hispanic, followed by black, and also seeing an increase in Asians. Uh, the, uh, in our white residents, we're actually seeing a decrease increasing proportion of cases uh, since November of 2021. Um, although we are seeing uh, increase of burden of disease here also in the city of Seattle, our highest really remain outside of the city uh, with Auburn, Kent, Federal Way, Burien, Renton, Tukwila, SeaTac, and South King County area. Um, 
hospitalizations are getting a lot of attention for good reason. Um, as you can see uh, from this graph, uh, just a huge spike of, uh, uh, in, uh, of increased cases here uh, needing to be hospitalized. I know in the language that we have seen uh, in the media and uh, coming is that it is less severe, uh, but even um, a little bit of a lot is still a lot. Uh, so in contrast to our tenfold increase in cases, hospitalizations have increased by fivefold. Um, so what that means is we were seeing on an average in the Delta variant about seven um, uh, hospitalizations uh, per day. And now what we're seeing uh, here with the Omicron is about 52 hospitalizations per day. Uh, per day. So about a five-fold increase from where we were in December uh, in seeing our hospital admissions. This increase in hospitalizations is really coming you know, to a real challenge for our hospital systems. You know, Not only did we have the Delta surge, but we also have an increasing non-COVID hospitalizations. Uh, and then of course, staffing shortages uh, with our medical teams uh, some that have resigned, some that have uh, quit, uh, some that uh, have been out because of illness. Uh, and also uh, the other part that's really uh, taxing our system in particular is really having uh, difficult to discharge patients in to, uh, other settings because of outbreaks that are going on in long-term care facilities or a lack of uh, staffing uh, in places to put folks uh, who may not need to be in the hospital, but yet not well enough to be out on their own at this particular time. So most recent hospitalizations are highest uh, that we're seeing around our COVID cases are among uh, our 40 to 69 year olds and 70 plus followed by our 20 to 39 year olds. Hospital rates for adults are really increasing with age and remain you know, very low in our youth population as opposed to what we've seen in other, other jurisdictions. Uh, good news, uh, when we look at our deaths, uh, there, there really are no major changes uh, currently. Uh, that we're seeing in death. Uh, we've uh, been averaging uh, through the Delta variant about one to three deaths um, uh, per day. Uh, and, uh, our and our latest report was about two. So really un unchanged in this particular area of, of where we we've seen deaths. This is an important slide. And if you are a New York Times reader, there was a, an article this morning that uh, talked about New York and Seattle. Uh, and really that this really continues uh, to be a, a uh, uh, another surge of people who really are unvaccinated. Um, this is, um, if I can just orient you to this uh, graph in front of you, uh, we look at cases on the left-hand side, center is our hospitalizations and then our deaths. And going back into August of 2021 20, until uh, beginning of January, first uh, week in January, is we can see that the blue line represents uh, people who are unvaccinated. The gray line represents people who are vaccinated and the orange line is the overall King County number. And of course that number is low and tends to follow the gray line is because we're such a highly vaccinated community. But this uh, just clearly illustrates uh, that in all three of these incidences of cases, hospitalizations and deaths, that our greatest spikes are among those people who are unvaccinated or unboosted. Uh, and uh, although we are seeing uh, in cases increasing in people who are vaccinated, we're seeing less of those uh, cases needing to be hospitalized or experiencing death. It's just an important uh, visual to remind mind us and also to uh, remind us that this is where our greatest work is and our greatest tool in preventing severe illness and death is really about getting the importance of vaccines. We know that uh, right now uh, that, um, uh, that not only our vaccines are our good uh, tool in this particular area, but we also uh, have other tools in this multi-strategy is really critical about limiting our indoor spaces, avoiding crowded and poorly ventilated areas uh, for folks, well-fitted masks. This is a message that we're really trying to 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 um, to really get out into the community and any help you can do uh, with this is, is much appreciated. Uh, really having well-fitted masks uh, or respirators uh, are really, really key and we're distributing as many as we can into the community. Uh, KN95s are, are equivalent, or people can use double masks or double surgical masks, but really well-fitting masks are really critical uh, uh, in this particular uh, outbreak. And the next slide I want to share with you uh, is just, you know, kind of the general pieces of this is, you know, there are a few things about Omicron that are unique and challenging in different ways that I want to uh, highlight here. Uh, as I mentioned, our colleagues at the UW who do a lot of the modeling, about 90% of our transmission right now is uh, of the Omicron variant. 
Uh, we, it's predicted, uh, looking at uh, what we've seen in other countries and what we're seeing on the East Coast, that uh, we're hoping is, is true for us is we would anticipate by mid to late January, we'll be peaking uh, at our highest point and then start that come down period. Uh, of course, you know, that uh, will vary on uh, things that are unique to our own community uh, that we're watching very closely. You know, our age distributions are different, uh, underlying health conditions in our population. Uh, of course, we have some of the highest vaccine coverage uh, in the country. Uh, you know, we have uh, looking at past infection rates, uh, the time of season that this is hitting us and uh, kind of uh, how our community uh, adjusts or doesn't adjust to social mixing and behaviors around distancing. All will will determine about that when that peak will actually happen and when we begin to come down. Things are likely going to be a bit more difficult before they get better as we move into that before we hit to that peak and start coming down. So we plan uh, as part of this, because of, again, the burden of disease is so high in our community that uh, there'll be large numbers of people becoming ill uh, in the short time and which will be resulting and we're already starting to see an absenteeism of work and workplaces uh, and um, hospitalizations, uh, staffing uh, continue to be, will be challenged from that. So we should uh, anticipate uh, that those things will continue to, to really make a, a challenge for us. I heard it said, and I think it's a, a worth repeating is, uh, although this uh, Omicron may be milder for individuals, it certainly is taking a toll and not as mild on our communities as it has the impacts of our, our hospital systems and our workforces as they're gonna be impacted in this work. Um, I think uh, one of the things we continue to raise here as our success here in uh, Seattle and in the King County area is uh, our vaccine rates are just outstanding. Uh, for five and older, as you can see from this graph, uh, we are over 80% of people who have completed their vaccines and uh, now uh, almost at 90% of people who have received their first dose. So this is really a huge uh, testament uh, to uh, the, the protection that we have going in our community. So uh, good data points. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you see the maps of King County and uh, as those are distributed uh, where our protection rates uh, really come into play. It's a reminder, you know, for folks, it's really important for folks uh, to get their boosters uh, when they're eligible for boosters. Um, and uh, in our county, we've done over 800,000 booster shots um, or third doses uh, have already been administered. Um, we um, are pushing that number more. The demand is high uh, and trying to meet that demand in a variety of ways of increasing uh, access points uh, and uh, using a variety of modalities in order to be able to get things out there. Uh, people are eligible to get appointments scheduled. And, um, and again, uh, we're getting uh, more capacity in the community and uh, really meet having some inroads of success as we move forward to that. So the message uh, that I wanna get out to folks is it is important to continue to see people getting vaccinated if you're not vaccinated and get boosted uh, uh, when you're eligible to be boosted uh, and getting our um, colleagues and our community members and family and friends uh, to follow that piece. If you need to find a place of where to get vaccinated, you can certainly go to our King County COVID uh, vaccine site uh, and it will help direct people to those particular area. Um, one uh, piece I want to share here, uh, I know that mo a lot of I've heard from uh, a few of you, uh, as well as other electeds, that testing has really been uh, a challenge. And uh, we know that that is the case. Uh, when you've seen this, you know, tenfold increase of disease in the community, that also means exposures are high. And it's really driving the demand on our test testing areas. And, uh, and we are doing everything we can to uh, to meet that demand as best we can. We, we've worked with the federal government to help bring in some sites um, and to, uh, to, to offset where we've ordered a number of rapid uh, test kits to uh, get into the community. You've heard the governor make that announcement. Uh, not all of those have arrived yet. And, uh, and when they do, we'll get those distributed uh, out into the community. Uh, part of our challenge also was uh, during the, the winter uh, cold weather snap that we had around the holidays, uh, we had a reduced capacity uh, uh, at those sites because of weather and also some staffing challenges as we're seeing uh, this surge of Omicron is also having an impact on our own workforce uh, and be able to show up and be able to provide the work that is needed. So we, we do know there are some really tough pinch points here in tests, um, but uh, is getting better. 
We've uh, in at the county, uh, we have purchased over 700,000 uh, tests, uh, and our goal is to get 100,000 uh, tests uh, uh, distributed into the community as quickly as we can. We're prioritizing those tests, those, at least those initial tests, into our high risk settings um, uh, where we need to around our long term care facilities, adult family homes, our, emer our emergency medical services, our healthcare facilities. Uh, really are needing some help right now in testing and uh, their own staff and uh, residents in these congregate settings, including correctional facilities. Uh, we've had, you know, major um, cases uh, there and those outbreaks continue to increase at high numbers uh, and concerning for us of, of our most vulnerable folks. Uh, so we're really prioritizing our test kits into those areas and getting them out uh, followed into our broader community, community centers and community-based organizations uh, in that mix here as we get more tests in. Once it's kind of the spigot analogy, once we get this turned on and they start coming in, we'll have a better flow, uh, not only from our federal partners, but from the state and what we're purchasing here locally. So I do anticipate that this will get better over the next week uh, and uh, we'll, we'll make some progress here in, in where we go. Um, I know some questions have come up around testing for schools uh, in the antigen test. Uh, the Department of Health has that responsibility and is doing uh, a good job in meeting that demand uh, and working directly with schools in order for them to for their own testing programs. Because uh, we, as you know, we have a high commitment of keeping to in, uh, in person learning as best we can uh, for for our students. In the next slide here, uh, in my closing comments, uh, you know, is it's more of the same. Uh, is we have a lot of protective factors that are going well for us in this community. We've got the right policies in place. We are requiring masks to be worn in indoor areas. We just need to get people to, to, um, to enforce that and make sure that uh, we're meeting those things uh, that are already in place. We, uh, uh, of course, have uh, vaccine mandates, uh, uh, vaccine, uh, verifications uh, in places where people are gathering in indoor places. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, of course, reiterating these messages as hard as we can about get vaccinated if you're not vaccinated, get boosted uh, now at five months after your initial booster for one of the mRNAs or two months after the Johnson & Johnson if you're eligible, wear a high quality, uh, good fitting mask. Uh, we, we're learning more and more in the science around indoor ventilation and air quality um, is critically important uh, and and if people are needing to gather in those spaces is getting good ventilation in is really, really critical. And at this time, you know, asking people to take as much of a break as they can around crowding in indoor places and dis and keeping that social distancing. All the same message was being given and are uh, even more so now critically important uh, as we as we move forward. So I will uh, stop there and uh, and happy to answer any questions. Um, around where we're at and what we are anticipating uh, in the next uh, little bit here. Thank you so much, Director Warsham. I really appreciate you taking some time to be here. Um, do you have a couple more minutes? I know you're really pressed for time. Um, of course, I'd love to uh, help uh, answer any questions. And if we can't, we'll get you back the right answers and Perfect. always happy to do follow up uh, by email if needed. Thank you so much. Um, if folks can, um, Indicate in the participants panel by virtually raising your hand. That helps me um, see whether or not you have a question. I do have two very quick questions. Yeah. One related to um, the hospital, the rise in hospitalizations, um, and uh, I know there has been a call to action related to the um, rise in hospitalizations from the Washington State Medical Association. I'm just wondering if you could um, speak to what you've seen. Um, we, we've seen the data on the increase in hospitalizations, but what do you know about the impact of that increase on hospital capacity locally? And then secondly, um, just really appreciate you um, recognizing um, the difficulties around testing um, and uh, appreciate the, um, the availability of, of, of tests being made um, uh, throughout the county um, and appreciate the, the need to focus on vulnerable communities. Um, but what's, what's your advice to folks right now who, who, who need a test um, and are unable to find one? Thanks. Yeah, 
Yeah, lots of uh, good questions and, um, and I'll do my best to answer those. Uh, let's start with hospitalizations. It's probably the most critical I have seen our hospital situation in, uh, in, in at least my time here with, with this uh, Omicron variant being so high. Um, uh, it, it, the, the, the issue is on several fronts. Uh, one of them is the staffing capacity on the front end has been really challenged. Um, uh, not only uh, uh, as we've heard, you know, through reporting in other industries, but, you know, the great resignation during this time of COVID of people who were eligible to retire, retired or leaving the field um, has really caused a really a tough, a tough road here. And now uh, with Omicron in place and the high infection rates being, you know, in the thousands every day, and we know those numbers that we have are underreported, um, is it's taking a, t a toll on uh, people who are able to provide care are also uh, becoming infected and needing to, uh, we've seen the CDC change their guidelines uh, to five days or uh, other strategies in order to get workforce back as quickly as they can uh, into those environments to provide the care that is needed. The, um, so the Department of Health is working very closely on this issue uh, and the governor's office with directly with the healthcare system in order to provide additional capacity and support uh, as they can around, um, around uh, staffing uh, areas. The other area that is on the back end of this uh, that is also a challenge is really around what we call difficult to discharge. And as we look at some you know, folks, uh, whether they are living unhoused or whether they are elderly and live alone is that they're not able to go to a care facility mm -hmm. uh, because those care facilities are also having outbreaks and can't accept new people. And so um, um, so there's just a pinch point there. And so again, the Department of Health is working to stand up some maybe alternative health uh, places where people can uh, be discharged to to free up some of that capacity within the hospital and create more beds to be available. So it's kind of a multi-prong uh, approach and, uh, and not, not one easy solution to any of them. It's kind of a multi-factor uh, that they're doing and working very closely with calls every day uh, to make uh, some improved outcome here uh, in, in this work. So that's about the healthcare system. Regarding testing, we're gonna be putting out a blog today uh, and we're happy to send that if you wanna send that out to other folks. Is It's a reminder is if you can't get a test, um, or find a place to be tested, uh, although we know that capacity is starting to open up a bit more, uh, is that if you have been exposed is to isolate and quarantine uh, yourself and not put yourself out there uh, until you're able to get a test and give it at least, you know, a few days. Uh, and if symptoms occur is, you know, don't circulate. Uh, and um, of course, you know, just the, all of the protective factors that you can do and not spreading the virus uh, until you can until you can get a test. But uh, Again, I think that's going to change here in the next week in particular, uh, and we're going to be sending out some messages about what folks can do uh, in the short run. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, other council members, uh, do you have questions for Director Wortham? I am not, I'm not seeing any additional raised hands. Really appreciate you being with us here, and thank you for all that everybody at um, Seattle King County Public Health are doing um, now and over the last uh, nearly two years now. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you making making the extra extra time today. Um, and um, our, our hearts and, and thoughts are with you as you do this really important um, and difficult work at um, a time where I know people are really um, stressed out and, and burnt out. But as you said, they're still rising to the occasion. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And uh, anything we can do to support you in getting the messages out, uh, let us know where um, we appreciate the partnership. All right. Thank you so much. Happy New Year. All right. Um, Alex, could you please read in agenda item number three? Agenda item number three, briefing on the December 9 emergency 911 system outage for briefing and discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Lombard, for being here with us. Are you our, um, our only presenter today? I am. All right, so I'm just gonna hand it over to you, introduce yourself, tell us um, who you are and why you're here. Um, really appreciate that, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Herbold, uh, and good morning, uh, President Juarez and other members of council. Uh, I'm currently the interim director of the newest department in the city of Seattle, the Community Safety and Communications Center. 
Uh, and so uh, Council Member Herbold had asked that I provide a, a briefing on the 911 uh, outage uh, that we had last week, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, last month, and then give you guys also a couple other just quick updates on where we are with the forming of this new city department. Uh, if we can get the slides up. Or I can ask that, Mr. Clark, do you want me to just share my own or <laughs> I have copies? I can bring it up for you. Okay. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so on the first slide is, whoops, <laughs> almost there. Are you seeing that now, Director? I'm seeing it, yes. Go, yeah, go ahead and uh, we can scroll up. So on the first slide to report here, uh, council has, uh, we had reported to council last year and, and, and council has been monitoring some of the staffing challenges that we've had over at the CSCC. Uh, this is, uh, we continue to be significantly understaffed. Uh, this is actually not just a city of Seattle challenge, uh, but it's also the other 911 centers throughout the, the region and actually a nationwide uh, issue. We had been, even with that, we had been very aggressively trying to hire and fill some of our spots, uh, doing lots of recruiting. Uh, unfortunately, the vaccine mandate uh, for all of its benefits still set us back about six to eight months. We lost uh, approximately 10% of our workforce due to the vaccine mandate. So that kind of started us over. So you'll see that I've circled some of the numbers. The communications dispatcher number one, that's our 911 call takers. You can see that we are at less than uh, half of our allocated staffing there. So that's where we really are struggling the most with 911 calls. We do have a lot of the dispatcher twos and dispatcher threes that all step in and try to answer those calls as best they are able. This also gets to the issue that we've reported previously on the, the non-emergency or the SPD business line uh, being shut down or shuttered during different times of the day. And I'll report more on that in a little bit here. Our total numbers for 2021, you can see circled in red there at the bottom. Uh, while we lost a record number of people, 33 people, and again, this is uh, due to the COVID vax mandate. This is uh, stress. This is kind of spillover from some of the, the, the protesting and whatnot from the previous year. Uh, that was, we were able to hire almost a record number of people as well, the 23, but that still was a net change uh, of a loss of 10 people. On the good news, we did just start yet another class uh, just this last Friday of six people. Uh, we've been doing classes uh, about every month and a half uh, to try to get those people in, in hired and trained into the positions. We continue our, try, our we are continuing to try to hire our back office support staff. This is one of the things that has also been kind of helping, or I'm sorry, hurting our recruiting potential is that we are not yet fully staffed out as a department. We, like many other city departments, are struggling to hire HR positions, finance positions, uh, and, and many more. The city has you know many of these vacant positions posted, and like so many industries. Uh, there's just a lot of people are just not applying for jobs right now. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to report back uh, to council, I know at the very end of the year, there was a lot of uh, questions uh, from you as far as the impact of the uh, the previous administration's hiring incentives. As a reminder, those incentives were for us uh, $10,000 for new hires and 20, up to $25,000 for laterals. We did see about a five-fold increase over some of the previous years. And this was actually good. This has helped our numbers look a lot better than they would have otherwise. These uh, incentives are among, actually they are the highest in the nation. Uh, which was a phenomenal statement as far as the value that Seattle puts into our 911 system and our 911 call takers and dispatchers. Uh, classroom training typically takes about four weeks and then it's followed by six to seven weeks of uh, training on the floor where people with supervision are actually taking 911 calls and kind of learning the craft. So a new hire can take about three months to fully vest. 
Uh, the numbers that you see there since the announcement came out, that's the 393 applications. That refers to the five-fold increase that I was talking about over the previous years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just some numbers on where we are with the 911 answering. Again, I kind of mentioned that we've been struggling just with the, the lack of numbers here. Uh, just as for the last week, our statistics here, the standard and our hope is to answer 90% of the 911 calls within 15 seconds. We were able to meet that uh, pretty close. You can see the average was about 89.73. So even with our staffing crunch, uh, we are just barely under the standard. Uh, now again, we've taken all round kinds up. of, <laughs> we've, we've made all <laughs> kinds of, yes, round up. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the challenge of course, is that we've taken all kinds of measures to get to that point and, uh, you know, not answering SPD's business line and taking incredibly long times to answer uh, some of the secondary calls to do that, you know, with the priority being on active ongoing emergencies. Uh, so we, you know, the hope is, is that as we get more people, we can really start to round out the, the better customer service, uh, you know, taking more time to answer people and, and help them uh, with whatever challenges that have led them to call 911. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, yes, sorry. Move on. Thanks. Um, on, on that, um, you know, those, those fractions of a second, um, you know, obviously can make a big difference in um, somebody's um, health safety in their in their lives when calling and calling 911 um and so I, I don't mean to make light of um your efforts to to meet that national standard um as it relates specifically to um the efforts to staff up um of the 393 applications that you've received since the incentive um announcement have you sort of already gone through that bunch to determine how many are viable um applications um just so, so we can sort of get a sense on on how um that i understand that's the incentives have allowed you to um increase the number of applications five times but i think um an important metric is to look at um whether or not that increase um is representative of of the applicants as well sure uh yeah if the clerk could go back just a couple slides to the, the there we go right there so if you look below the circled ones you'll see what uh really is a math game you know the more people we get applying and then we lose a certain percentage uh to the testing process and then we lose a certain percentage in the interviews and so on and so forth so what you see below there uh are the the kind of the different incremental steps in the process then so, so yeah, only 22 big... of the 393 are folks that you selected for for interviews just for just for this period right here so it's kind of an ongoing process we switched so that our application process isn't like in windows now it's just ongoing as they come in we keep pushing them into the testing process uh, once they go out of testing, uh, you know, we're doing interviews, we're doing background, we're doing psychs. So actually, council member, if you were to total up those numbers, uh, you know, 22 plus 11 plus 9 plus 7, that gives you a better picture of how many of the 393 Got are it. getting pushed through at any given time, given the limitations of how many we can interview at a, any given time, how many the, the testing company can do, and, and so on and so forth. That's super helpful. Thank you. And I, um, I also want to say that I am supportive of a 2022 um, bonus incentive um, for for city employees. And I know that the um, the executive um, is uh, intending to prepare a report on the council's request. Um, it's due in March. Um, the sooner we get it, I think the sooner we can have these discussions. Um, the old uh, 2021 incentive bonus program was only for CSCC and the police department. Our request is to look at what the needs are citywide. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to um, to pref uh, preference the work of one department and the importance of uh, workers in one department over the other. And that's why uh, I'm pleased that the council uh, agreed that we need a, a, a citywide uh, analysis of, of each department um, and, and 
design a um, incentive bonus program that serves the great needs of uh, employees in all of our departments and 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 members of the public who are receiving service from all these departments. So um, just want to want to state um, on the record here that the the sooner we get that information back from the executive, the sooner we can have that conversation about a 2022 uh, bonus incentive program. Thank you, council member. Uh, okay, so. Uh, you know, I made a quick reference on what that means. You know, we have been doing everything. We've been throwing all of our resources at, at 911. Uh, so here is kind of the downside or the negative impact uh, from the time period listed. We were unable to answer SPD's non-emergency line for about 15.6% of the time. That's about 51 hours. Now, of course, you know, that's not even distribution. So unfortunately, uh, we're able to answer it in the middle of the night, but there aren't a whole lot of people calling, you know, SPD's business line in the middle of the night. So, uh, you know, distribution curves being what they are, uh, unfortunately, that is quite a few hours during the day uh, that we're just not able to answer it because we're putting all those resources to 911. It's pretty sporadic. Uh, some of the outages have been as, as low as five to 15 minutes. Uh, some of them have been a couple hours long. So we, again, we are trying to do as, as much as we can with the people and the resources that we have. Next slide, please. Uh, okay. Oh, do people yep. receive a, um, an automated message when you're unable yes. to? Yes. And, and are you, do you direct those folks to um, online reporting? Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, great question. So the the automated messaging has two parts. It has, you know, a messaging that can refer people to other resources, online reports and whatnot. And then eventually we'll kick them into a, you know, a press one for press two for press three for to actually get them to to some other resources. So it's it, yes, you're correct, council member. It is not just a strictly too bad, so sad. Thank you. And just to, for folks listening, what we're talking about right now is for the non emergency line. Correct. Uh, this is another project that council was very enthusiastic in their support for last year. This is what we are calling our dispatch protocol project. The effort uh, in this project is to really get a software package that will help our 911 call takers uh, be a lot more consistent in how they are taking, screening, and uh, resourcing different incoming 911 calls. Our hope. Uh, is that this is working in partnership with the, the Triage One program mentioned previously as far as non-police resources. Uh, this is also part of trying to improve uh, reducing or diminishing bias in calls. Uh, and, and again, just trying to get overall more consistency to help quality assurance, to help our metrics and everything. The project team had its first operational meeting just last week. Uh, the red star is kind of where we are in there. We're getting ready to, to start with the RFP process uh, to identify the different vendors in this space and who might have the best fit or best solution for Seattle and what we're looking to grab. Uh, we hope to be able to finish that up by June of this year and actually start building and implementing uh, the product uh, in June. Uh, so it's, um, again, this is an exciting one. We're moving forward with this. Uh, and and then um, again, hopefully, hopefully uh, finishing it up by the end of the year. And I just want to flag here. Um, one, I, I I am a little concerned that the RFP process is five months. I am concerned that we're just um, getting started on it, um, given the fact that um, when we talked during the council's deliberations on the uh, biennial budget adjust adjustment, um, we decided that it was not a good idea to wait until the deliberations on the 2022 budget because um, CSCC would not have those funds available to, to do the RFP and to develop the RFP until the beginning of 2022. And so the council's action on um, getting getting those dollars um, for the dispatch protocol project um, in, I believe, August, um, early August, mid-August, before, before the break, was intended to make um, the delivery of the project happen more quickly than if we had waited until the um, budget discussions for 2022 that would not be in effect until until now. 
Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, the timeline here and um, how uh, what is proposed might um, not quite meet our, our hopes and dreams when, when we discussed this back in uh, late July and um, early August. Yeah, thank you. No, I absolutely share your frustration, council member. Uh, so what we've been running into is actually, uh, you know, without being too disparaging, city process. Um, the so the, because of the size of the project, the funding involved, and the magnitude, it had to be assigned a project manager. So there was a vetting process uh, to get that that involved other departments. We had to compete with all the IT projects in the city. Uh, now, again, fortunately, we ended up on top because of the public safety nature uh, and, and the impact that this has on police and on fire and on other departments, but we still had to go through that process nonetheless. So that, you know, that shoes up a couple weeks. Once they identify the project manager, uh, you know, all of this stuff that you see, again, unfortunately, is, um, again, not, not trying to diss on my own beloved city here, but it's, it is kind of the bureaucracy as far as the necessary hoops that we have to go through uh, in the interest of being open and forthright with the public as far as how the money is being sent, spent and, and, you know, giving everybody a fair chance to bid on it and whatnot. Uh, so this is this is what I've been told, uh, the fast tracking uh, for the process to make sure that we are adhering with our own our rules and regulations to, to have an open and fair process, um, if that helps. Thank you, Director Lombard. And the reason why this uh, protocol project is so important is it allows um, the dispatchers to ask a set of questions um, that uh, will help facilitate the development and implementation of other um, non-uniform um, police responses. So it is an integral part of the infrastructure that needs to be in place before we make policy changes. And in those policy changes, we've often talked about them as, um, uh, as being driven by uh, desire for better outcomes by having people who um, are better trained um, and better equipped to um, to respond to certain 911 calls that don't require a uh, uniformed officer. Given the fact that we have such a reduced number of police officers now to respond to those high priority 911 calls, there's also a public safety um, urgency associated with the development of alternatives. We don't, we simply don't have enough um, police officers to respond to all the calls that uh, 911 receives. We want to make sure that officers are not responding to things that they don't need to respond to, not just because we don't want the, the negative outcomes that sometimes happen, but because we want those officers to really be responding to only the things that they can, and we don't have enough officers to do that right now. So just want to uh, emphasize um, that there's a there's a public safety interest as well um, in um, as it relates to sort of traditional public safety as opposed to the broader community safety that we're talking about um, in being able to respond um, quickly to those calls. Councilmember Lewis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to uh, jump in and echo uh, that urgency. And, and I really want to applaud Director Lombard for working in very challenging circumstances to try to um, emphasize that shared urgency that this council has for this project. Uh, I had the great privilege of taking a tour um, while Director Lombard was was unfortunately uh, in Washington, D.C. on a trip, so, so I couldn't um, join um, him in person but a, a tour of the 911 call center where a lot of these concerns were really um, laid bare um, by the folks working there in terms of wanting these new tools, wanting these new services, wanting the ability to be more responsive to, to the calls for service from Seattle residents. And I, I do just want to, to, to further um, uh, support Chair Herbold's point uh, we all are really well aware that there is a bottleneck in police hiring that is going along with the deficit in police officers that we currently have. Uh, the council for two years in a row, row has fully funded a police hiring class, um, but as there's, there's always attrition uh, as people are coming in, people are going out, there's of course been higher than usual attrition over the course of the last two years. To really respond to this crisis, just to put a fine point on it, we need to be able to hire 
some of these other services that can take on certain calls to free up the police to do things only the police can do. And just in terms of these sessions being helpful for issue spotting for the incoming administration, I would just continue to put a fine point on anything that can be done to, to fast track this dispatch protocol from the incoming administration um, is going to be time well spent to respond to the, the social service and public safety emergency we see on the street. And I just want to lift up the efforts that, of uh, Director Lombard and, and um, uh, accentuate that this is a council priority and, and one that we look forward to working with the Herald administration on, on hopefully moving this, these deadlines faster, um, if possible. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the next slide, uh, based on, on what uh, both of you were saying, uh, this is one of the alternatives. So just a, a quick recap, as we were coming into the holiday season at the end of the year, uh, we had council had talked and, uh, and, and working with council, we had agreed that launching both the protocol and the triage one program simultaneously, that would uh, that would get things going a lot faster as opposed to doing first the protocols and then trying to build the triage one system. Uh, as council knows in our briefings towards the end of last year, uh, working with the fire department uh, using their existing mobile integrated health program to help us build this CSCC resource, uh, we, we wanted uh, labor had expressed an interest in talking uh, with fire and CSCC as we're building it out to kind of you know, where are the lines between our firefighters and EMTs and our patrol officers and in, in the middle, uh, the health practitioners and whatnot that might be in this middle program. I'm happy to report that last week, uh, we kicked off those meetings right after the new year, uh, had our first meeting with labor to kind of work through some of those issues and kind of express, you know, where this is the middle ground that, as we've discussed, uh, that there may or may not be uh, overlap on on the spectrum, trying to identify, okay, you know, whose who's body of work is what and, and where's kind of this, uh, this, you know, neutral zone in between. So I will report more uh, in, in the future on how those meetings are progressing and we're looking forward to keep moving this project forward. Next slide, please. All right, so the outage, I'll get to this really quickly and kind of go through these next slides pretty quickly to kind of summarize what happened. Uh, December 9th, uh, 2021, last year, we had a statewide outage uh, that occurred in the afternoon. Uh, the company that has what's called the EziNet, this is like an internet that connects all the 911 centers in the state of Washington and routes all the 911 traffic. Uh, the company Comtech was doing some maintenance on the this EziNet throughout the state. Uh, normally, there's a couple redundancies built into the system, and when they do maintenance on one, it's supposed to automatically switch over to one of the alternative or the B side of it. For whatever reason, this did not happen. We don't know yet why that didn't happen, uh, but both the state 911 office and King County 911 are investigating and should have some answers and feedback on that uh, soon. What happens when that uh, failure occurs? is that 911 lines then get routed to alternatives for every single 911 center. In our case, the, we have uh, a secondary or backup and then our non-emergency, I'm sorry, not the secondary line, but a, an alarm company reporting line and the, the backup line, as we've talked about earlier in this presentation. Next slide. One of the challenges that we found is that when 911 lines start coming in on those, it doesn't present normally with like the caller ID or what we call our Annie Alley. Uh, so there's a little uh, confusion that happens from the call takers perspective, as far as, again, not recognizing it right away as an outage. The outage actually uh, only lasted for just over an hour, 1521 to 1643 hours. Um, what happened is our, our folks did quickly realize that those were some emergency numbers coming in. The part of the other aspect of the challenge that made it difficult to identify is that it wasn't immediate, that we were still getting some lines or some emergencies coming in on 911 as well. Uh, so once we identified it, our supervisors were able to jump on it, confirm that uh, in fact, 911 calls were coming through some of those non-emergency lines. Mm. Again, this is the business one that we shut on, shut off. So the supervisor immediately turned that on so that people would hear it 
and then directed all the 911 callers to start answering uh, all those lines with equal priority, uh, regardless of whether it was the business line or a 911 line, knowing that we were getting emergency calls coming in on both. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, even with the, the hiccup or the snafu caused by uh, the EziNet failure, the EziNet fell over, uh, for the first part of this event, we did recognize that call volumes actually were pretty consistent for this hour. This hour, So we don't believe that we lost any 911 calls. We feel that, uh, that they came in, they probably just came in on different lines and whatnot. So call volume, at least for the first part of it, uh, was pretty consistent. Because we weren't sure of the cause or of the nature, because we suspected that some 911 calls may have been getting dropped, and again, in the first moments after this happens, you know, there's a lot of size up and troubleshooting trying to figure out what happened. We started coordinating with the fire alarm center and with the emergency operations center. So the decision was made to send out an alert Seattle message just to those here within the city of Seattle that if people were not able to connect to 911, then to call the two backup or the business line numbers and only for emergencies. And I've got the actual text of the, the, the message or the message of the, that was included in the text sent there. Those public alerts were sent out uh, also by SPD's Twitter uh, and again, the Office of Emergency Management in Seattle. So we had some, we identified some problems there that are also being in, looked into. The WEA messages, those uh, are kind of similar to like the Amber Alerts and, and the Silver Alerts that we get. Unfortunately, one of those messages went way beyond just the city of Seattle or, or those in Seattle that have requested to get alert Seattle messages. That was part of the problem. One of the other parts of the problems is that many, many, many of those receiving the message, uh, for whatever reason, whether they didn't read through it all or misunderstood it, uh, both reasons that were re-looking at the message content and how to clarify it even further, thought that they were supposed to call these numbers. So uh, because of these combinations of efforts, uh, a message that people didn't read completely a message that maybe we need to reform a little bit, and then a message that went way beyond Seattle that we thought, we basically imposed almost like a, a self-imposed denial of service. Uh, we saw uh, a huge surge in calls that happened almost right after it happened. So thank you for the slide there. What you see there is the big spike uh, went out about a minute after the call. So we went from about two or three calls uh, in the minute before to up to 40. Uh, now, each of the lines coming into Seattle can only handle 40 calls at a time. That's the number of trunks that we have coming into the city, and then it just busies out. All of those got maxed within a minute. The floor, uh, the supervisors just described it as going crazy. So everybody kind of reported all hands on deck. Go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Uh, in the following hour after the messaging went out, we saw a surge of over 1,000 calls uh, to 911. Uh, almost all of those were determined to be, again, people calling saying, am I supposed to report or am I supposed to check this number or is there a problem with 911? Uh, unfortunately, it sounds like we need to do some public messaging as far as don't call 911 if you don't have an emergency. Uh, this was an increase of about 1200% over what we normally get. Again, the normal for that hour during the day is about 79 calls. Uh, ComTech recorded that the outage was resolved about 1643 hours and shortly after the operations began to stabilize. I All mean, right, so, yep. Yeah. I understand the, uh, the issue where people misread the message that didn't tell them to call but told them if they had emergency, this is where you call. Can you speak to, so I, I, that's human error and maybe there's the, the text could have been worded differently or maybe no matter how it was worded, there is going to be some number of people who are going to misinterpret it. Um, but on the other element where the um, announcement went out to people outside of the city of Seattle, um, folks who should not have received the announcement in the first place, can you speak to why that happened? Sure. So if we can assume, a, you know, that there's a certain percentage of the population that for whatever reason, through our own fault, just misinterpret the message, 
when that message went out to a much wider base, uh, it went to South Snohomish County, it went down all the way through King County, it went over to parts of Kitsap County. Uh, you know, it covered such a large area. We had people from all of those non Seattle regions calling those two numbers uh, listed in the message uh, with the same confusion. You know, am I, yeah, am I supposed that's to That's my call? question. Why did, why did a larger number of people right. receive okay. yeah. the message? No. Uh, so the, the the Office of Emergency Management is still trying to investigate that and kind of figure out what happened to that, uh, what they call the WEA messaging. It was not supposed to do that. So that for the forensics of that are actually still ongoing as to why that happened. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so again, the, the conclusions, I've already hit most of those. Uh, so we've already started working with King County 911 on uh, on messaging since it did hit all the 911 centers in the county that if we do alert Seattle messaging or something similar in the future, uh, our intent is that King County 911 should probably take the lead on messaging. They refer people to a website instead of phone numbers and then the website shows that, hey, if you live in this city, contact this number. If you live in this city, contact this number, so on and so forth. Uh, we feel that that would, would significantly improve uh, our response should something like this happen again. Uh, again, we don't have uh, specifics yet from the state or the county yet on why the EziNet automatic switchover did not happen, but we will report those back as soon as we can as well. Again, we believe that no 911 uh, calls were lost. They just came in on different lines and possibly took a little bit longer uh, for us to answer. Next slide. Uh, all right, that's uh, that's a snapshot uh, for where CSCC is and uh, some of our recent activities. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Nelson. Yes, thank you. After, yes, after I raised my hand, um, you got to uh, what I was raising my hand for, which is on page seven, uh, that um, the calls did not get routed to the B side, but this did not happen. And that seems to be the crux of the problem. So um, I, I await those answers. But my question or my, um, my question is a little bit broader than this um, than the slide pack, because my understanding is that King County holds the contract with Comtech, right? And um, Seattle is one public safety, uh, I think it is PSAP, let's see, public safety, yep. can't remember what that is an anachron for, but but what is the city's relationship to the county when it comes to um, uh, looking at this contract with Comtech and um, having input on um, operations and getting information about um, what goes wrong when, uh, when things happen? Sure. Thank you very much, Council Member. So, so PSAP actually stands for Public Safety Answering Point, uh, and that's kind of the the acronym for the 911 centers. Uh, so, the the ESI nets are actually uh, the Comtech ESI nets are actually that contract. Uh, I believe resides actually at the state level uh, because it impacts all, uh, not just Washington. Comtech's uh, contract actually is significantly even further beyond just the state of Washington. They have 911 services for a, a vast area. Uh, so the the state administers the 911 program through the county 911 systems. And so ours is, of course, King County 911 uh, through the county, uh, through their IT department. Um, and so the as far as the kind of the, the way that we funnel our complaints through or our programs is through that county who then uh, takes it up to the state. So our ability to impact Comtech uh, or to tell them, you know, what they can or can't do is really limited. Uh, we just have to use the representative of authority uh, through the King County 911 office. And, and they've been actually a great champion and a great partner in this. They, they jumped on that, you know, filed the appropriate tickets and have been working very aggressively to find out uh, what happened, what we can do to fix it, make sure it happened or doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, I have a I have a couple additional questions. I'm just before I jump in, I just want to see if any of my other colleagues do as well. Um, so, uh, 
just interested to know whether or not um, there was a national city uh, century link outage uh, in December of 2018. Are these the same types of issues that we're looking at here um, locally as what was seen with the uh, national um, outage several years ago? Um, and then as it relates to this particular event, um, and you may have covered it, I'm sorry, were all King County 911 dispatchers affected? And if not, what was different about the centers themselves that were not affected? Sure, no, great questions. Um, so the, the telephone switching system throughout the United States, of course, is very tiered. You know, you have the big ones covering nationwide stuff and that, that's kind of the 2018 one that you referred to. Uh, and then it breaks down by regions and, you know, into the much smaller uh, granules. So to your, the answer to your question is a little bit of yes and no. It, yes, in that you know they are kind of similar in that there were switching problems, mm -hmm. uh, but that's probably about as close as they were related. Uh, the the 2018 outage uh, was a cascade type failure, and that was actually a software programming issue where when the switch failed, the system was set up to transfer the load of calls to another switch. And what happened is through some software problems, they started uh, transferring, you know, these huge loads, na national call volume to, to other switches. And with each subsequent failure, the, the switch in that case couldn't handle the additional load. So they started failing faster and faster. Um, you know, I, I, can't, I guess if you were thinking of an analogy, you know, if you had a couple of dump trucks and one got a flat tire, you it'd be really hard to just take all of the dirt in one dump truck and put it in the one beside it because now its tires are going to be under even more stress and then mm -hmm. you can't you know you keep shoveling it to the next one eventually you're just going to bury the dump truck yeah. uh, so that was kind of the national outage so at the lo more local level in this case at the state level uh, this was another switch issue uh, that didn't fail over properly uh, but again, kind of different magnitude, and, and this one wasn't caused necessarily, we don't know yet if it was software or not, but it was not caused by, you know, this big surge load from uh, another switch failure somewhere else in the line. It was solely independent uh, on its failure. And then, I'm sorry, I, I forgot the second part of your question. Oh, it was all the PSAPs. Yes, all the other PSAPs in King County were affected by this uh, about the same time. Um, I suspect because of our call volume and our size, we were probably one of the earlier ones to notice it uh, mm -hmm. than some of the others. Uh, but it wasn't too long into the incident before we again started reaching out to King County 911 and then found out that, you know, okay, everybody's starting to have the, the same problem. Thank you. And then just moving forward, um, you talk about uh, whether or not the uh, CSCC has a continue of operation. Uh, con continuity of operations plan that can be used in situations like this um, and sort of what's the plan in uh, the unlikely likelihood but one that we would need to plan for that both the um, Seattle dispatch centers um, are down simultaneously both at CSCC and SFD um, also, um, just interested to know um, what's happening at the county or state level to increase continuity planning. And then lastly, how the um, countywide 911 platform modernization project for next generation 911 might reduce the likelihood of similar outages in the future. Sure, yeah, more great questions. Uh, so we do have a continuity of operations plan Unfortunately, it's a pretty old one. It still uh, is reminiscent from uh, when uh, 911 uh, was underneath the police department. And so it still has a lot of the police department uh, stuff over the top of it. Uh, unfortunately, we've been wanting and trying to get to it, uh, but because we, do, again, we're still working on some of the staffing issues uh, for, for the back office support staffing as well, we just haven't had uh, anybody to kind of give it the refresh yet. Uh, but that plan does address, you know, different types of failures, uh, like you were asking about council member, as far as, you know, is it out and out outage? Is it just part of the failover type system? 
uh, to address your question as far as big surges, you know, if both centers happen to be out, for example, and as you mentioned, both centers, at least on the local level, act as a backup for each other. So if we have to physically leave either of the 911 centers in Seattle, uh, they are redundant and backup to each other. So, you know, the, the CSCC dispatchers would come to the fire alarm center or vice versa to, to maintain operations. We did experience towards the end of last year, one such uh, failure that you were talking about. Uh, I think I had mentioned in previous testimony before the committee, there was a transformer that actually blew in Interbay. Uh, it caused a surge, uh, it made a big enough explosion that the 911 center received within a single minute about 80 911 calls uh, about the explosion, reporting it, asking about it and whatnot. In that type of a surge or in that type of a failure, the system is designed and all 911 centers are designed to appoint a backup center. Uh, the City of Seattle, uh, the CSCC in this case, has identified Spokane as our backup location and that has to do with geographic diversity, you know, if we get a big earthquake or something like that. Uh, in that case, Spokane did start receiving uh, some of the overflow calls uh, for our interbay transformer explosion. They were able to identify that it was a Seattle problem, but of course had no idea where the problem was or, or no ability to assign them, but they were able to reach out to us in that case, uh, you know, as far as the log number of calls and, and whatnot. Um, to update you on the, the project, uh, the project is, is well underway now as far as the 911 modernization. Uh, throughout the King County. And this is our, our PSAP kind of net or how we're all connected here at the county level. And that will, as you mentioned, council member, uh, have the potential to reduce, if not eliminate, a lot of these types of challenges. Uh, because all of the phone systems for all the 911 centers in the county will be identical, um, we will not be limited to just going to from the fire alarm center to CSCC or back and forth. Uh, it will provide options. Now we haven't worked out a lot of the policy yet. You have to have the capability first, uh, but it will allow some of the capability for our 911 folks to go to other 911 centers in the county as a backup option. Uh, we'll still have to work on how they get the computer aided dispatching and the radio access. But from a phone perspective, yes, they will be able to log on at other 911 centers and start receiving Seattle 911 call. So we're very excited about uh, that project as it continues along. Thank you so much, Dr. Lombard. Very appreciative of you taking the time to be here with us today um, and all the work that you're doing. Any other questions from council members still with us? Not seeing any. Um, so we'll conclude this item. Again, thank you, Dr. Lombard. Thank you very yeah. much. And um, next Public Safety and Human Services Committee is scheduled for Tuesday, January 25th um, at 9.30 a.m. Before we adjourn, are there any comments from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, it is 11.59 a.m. and we are adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody. Be well.